today who's um, bass player extraordinaire. That's how I know him. There's so many more leaves to your book, so many more caps that you wear, but today um, he has been extraordinarily generous in coming and playing on a song that's very special to me that you will hear called Letter to a Small Boy. If I could teach you all the secrets that I've learned about the world. And he's come to my very uh, lo-fi little attic space, even though he has recorded in probably some of the best studios in the world. And he did so very generously and without criticism, <laughs> especially with my um, very basic production skills. And did such a beautiful job that I had to hold back the tears. But Clive, okay, so I met you as a bass player but you're also an educator. You are a doctor yeah. nowadays, I understand, yes. and not the medical kind. I went full nerd <laughs> and did a PhD. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me at all. You, you are definitely a music nerd in the best possible way. Um, songwriter and um, producer extraordinaire mm -hmm. as well. So can you give us a, a Cook's tour? Yeah, okay. So grew up in Adelaide, uh, played in bands in high school rock bands, so I was listening to Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And Wasn't it Beatles or Rolling Stones? It was very much, but um, it was, to people older than us it was, but to us it was just oh, okay. music, it was just another song we could learn, and, yeah. and it was it came down to who's got what albums. Yeah, right. If, um, you didn't have everything, you didn't have Spotify. No, I, I, <laughs> you know, I didn't own, I, I think I owned one album at that point. And my older brother had a couple of Simon and Garfunkel records or something like that. But the guitarist in the band had, uh, he had, he, I think he might have had a couple of albums and the drummer had a Rolling Stones album. So we just learnt the songs off those albums. And um, anyway, I hitchhiked from Adelaide to Melbourne when I was, I just turned 17 I think, and uh, to make my fortune because that was the epicentre of the rock world in Australia. At least that was my impression because they had, had, they'd had Sunbury. Yeah. And there were all these bands and record companies and publishing companies that were coming out of Melbourne because of the radio band of 1972, which meant that everyone was playing Australian artists all the time. The top right. 40 was entirely Australian artists. So it started up the Australian music industry, the radio band. So uh, they just wouldn't... Um, they, the radio didn't want to pay royalties, pay a royalty for... Um, international artists or something. There was some sort of dispute about wow. that. Wow. And so the, really the, the record companies wanted them to pay them to use the songs yeah. from the Beatles and stuff. And so they just banned radio to stop playing anything from an imported label. And so... We need to have that happen again. Yeah. And so <laughs> so what happened was Mushroom and Mushroom Publishing and all these Australian bootleg label all fired up because there was an opportunity. And so you, you look at the top 40 in that, at that time period and there was... Uh, you know, just Australian bands, wall to wall Australian chain, Amazing. and, and uh, you know, Metal Lake, and any anyone that released a record in Australia had a ch good chance of getting on the top forty. Wow! So, uh, so I moved to Melbourne, decided that I needed to educate myself more about chords and theory. I, I played the piano in school and a bit of guitar and a bit of bass and classical organ and sang in the choir. So I had a background Gosh. in music, but. I wanted to understand why does this chord progression work and this doesn't and why does it suck when I get to that bit of the tune and what do I do, how do I get from, I'm now in A flat, how do I get back to C elegantly, you know, most people would just stop and then do a two bar drum fill and go back to C so I went no that sucks, that's ridiculous. I hearing jazz musicians, they seem to be changing key with clever ways, what, what's going on there, so they seem to know a lot about chords, so I thought oh, I'll get into the jazz. And my, some of the bass players I was listening to were the jazz bass players, and I was going, oh, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome, what they can do. Then '77, I went to the stage with Melanie, the folk singer. Can you tell us a little bit? Yeah, for people who don't know who Melanie, Melanie is. Melanie was at Woodstock. She sang at Woodstock. She sang. Uh, she had a bunch of hits, worldwide hits. Uh, I got a brand new pair of rollers. You got a brand new key. what you 
they've done, to, look what they've done to my song, Ma. And there was some other ones, Candles in the Rain, Alexander Beadle. She had a bunch of songs. So she did 17 albums by the time, she had 17 oh. albums by the time I worked with her in 1977. So I did a tour in Australia, picked up the tour, and then went back to the States with her and worked in Boston and New York a little bit. And then her manager was crazy, so I left. <laughs> um, long story. <laughs> um, and went to LA and lived with the, her piano player, Emil Pandolfi, who was a great classical pianist and, and, uh, and still plays and stuff like that. And he introduced me to the who's who of the LA scene. Right. And I caught up with the, the Australian mafia over there because there was at that point there was Brian Cadd, Steve Kipner from Tintin, who wrote Toast and Marmalade for Tea. Yes. So Brian Cadd was there. I'd worked with Brian in, in Melbourne and toured with him. Billy Thorpe was over there, and Doug Lavery, who was the drummer in the Twilights, I think. Um, so they now they had a bass player. Yeah, right. So immediately we started going in the studio and we were doing demos for Brian and for Billy Thorpe and, and Steve. They were writing all these songs, and we'd go into Capitol Records and sit there in the studio for a week and just record a whole bunch of songs with those guys. Thorpe was my idol. Because right. I was in the heavy, I was a young male. In, yeah, in Australia, course, you've, got to, you've got to give. The, I rode my push bike to Elizabeth from Adelaide, 25 miles, to the Octagon, uh, to see Thorpey when I was like 15 or something like that. Yeah. And I was too young to go to the My Ponga Pop Festival, um, but I hitchhiked to Sunbury and saw Thorpey at Sunbury in 73 or 74, playing at midnight. You know, so good, so good. And uh, I, I got to do this for a living. Yeah, is, I, I that, is that the moment? Uh, it wasn't, that wasn't the moment. Um, the, the, one of the things was um, playing in a band, in my first band at a high school, a, a tennis social for the high school uh, in Adelaide, and this girl came up to me and kissed me on the lips after the show. And I went... <laughs> I want more of that, please. <laughs> there's a chance, there's a chance for me here. <laughs> This could be a window of opportunity, <laughs> or a woo of opportunity. Um, I know a lot of great musicians who truthfully say, girls, that's yeah, why I started it playing. Wasn't, it wasn't my prime. <laughs> my primary motivation was always to be a, a respected, valuable musician. Right. And that was reflected because in 1977, I was with a band called Avalanche, and we were on Countdown a lot and getting played. We're getting... Um, a lot of press and stuff like that, and getting good fees, and so I was making a good living. By that stage, I was about 20, I guess, 77. And um, we did a school's, an all-girl all high school lunchtime concert. And um, that was the first, term, first time I directly experienced the whole pop thing. I'm Down that Sunday, and on Tuesday mm. lunchtime, we're in the hall, in the sports hall. Oh my hall. goodness! And there were all these girls. That all these girls were screaming, and we're playing our songs. And I'm, I'm thinking about the music, and I'm thinking about my harmonies that I have to sing, and, and the space sound in this room and stuff. And these girls are going crazy, and then, and the teachers are trying to calm down. The girls were getting hysterical, and I'm going. I, it was weird. It was like I'm, I'm on Mars, and then. Um, and then we said we're going to we've got to stop, and the siren went. We've got to stop now. And they rioted. They, there was about a thousand girls in this, or eight hundred girls or something in this, and they just jumped up on the stage. And, and all I, I had a Fender bass, and I was holding it above my head because I was frightened. I was, that was my pride and joy. Yeah, I'm holding like this, my and I'm tearing at clothes and ripping, pulling my hair and scratching and just oh it was goodness. like animals. And so we we ran in, into the dressing room of the hall and locked the door and the roadies were out there and they, the girls weren't interested in the roadies too much but they eventually the teachers got them all out and they took them all back and we just sat there for 40 minutes while they got the, all the kids back into the classrooms right so we wait we wait and wait and wait and, wait, and eventually the roadies had packed up most of the gear and we thought it was probably okay to go and it was sort of like 
on the one hand, it was exciting because yeah. we, we were experiencing what obviously the Beatles and everyone else had yeah. gone through, but it was also kind of scary and for me profoundly disturbing yeah. that I, I, this is not what I want to do. This is like, this is silly. Because I was on the telly, they want to scream and claw my, my clothes and pull my hair and act like, this is really weird and that's not what, I, I had no idea that this would okay. ever happen. Yeah. So, uh, at that stage I was starting to listen to a bit of jazz and not long after that gig, uh, as we left, as we went to drive out, we, we snuck out to the drummer's car, it was in the car park. But the girls knew that that was the car that we came in, of course. and they, we could hear screaming from the from the, cl the classrooms, and they had these sort of hopper window things that opened out like that, and girls were climbing out the window, and dropping into the garden, and then oh. running across the car park towards us. It was we weren't that special. We're just a band that happened to be on Countdown, but these girls were going absolutely crazy, and they and the drummer just floored it, and we hung a big donut. He he liked it. <laughs> had a big donut and drove out of the theatre. He was into a bit of the theatre, I thought. Yeah. And um, we drove out, and the other guys at the band were laughing, and it was so, it was so so much fun for them. For for me, it wasn't fun. It was oh. just, I kind of went, oh, I just there's something. I didn't sign up for this. No, it's really wrong. And then a couple of weeks later, I went and had a jam, my first ever jazz jam with, I think it was the Bob, no, the Brian Brown. Quartet at a little coffee shop in Ligon Street. I went and I watched them. I've been and watched them a few times. I went and I, they asked me to have a jam. I had a little jam with them. And at the end of the jam, this guy came up. It was literally cushions on the floor and people were drinking coffee. And a guy came up to me afterwards. He said, oh, I really liked what you did in that thing. It reminded me a bit of Ron Carter. And Ron Carter's like played with Miles Davis and stuff like that. And I thought, ah, that's kind of nonsense because I'm nothing like I'm playing electric bass for starters and everything. But but that's what I'm seeking. Right. I want musicians and music appreciators, music lovers, to go, you did a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of, I didn't want some girl going, oh, yous are all spunks, we love yous. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't want that. I wanted the other, and so yeah. I went, okay, I've, I've got to make a decision. So I left the band and moved to, moved to Sydney and bought a double bass and got into jazz. So I did that for a decade or 15 years or something like that and got into comp composition, film composition and TV and eventually stopped doing live gigs. But in the process of all that I played on 90, about 90 albums by 1988 when I stopped playing for other people and uh, just started working on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's now 99 albums. Which is why we had our conversation at a gig and you said you offered your services so that we could make it 100. I've caught up with Buzz Bidstrup from Ganga Jean at Christmas time and I'm going out to do a recording with him and we're doing a day of just some of his stuff. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're not stopping at 100. Well, I'm not I, stopping. I sort of stopped for, for a long time. I didn't do it, play it on anybody's records for a long time, but about 2006 I had a bit of a renaissance where I kind of got back into playing the bass. I didn't play live from 1988 to 2006. So 18 years of not playing gigs. Did you miss that? No. no. I was burnt out. Yeah. I was exhausted. I mm -hmm. played on so many things. I was touring over my own jazz group, a fusion band, a bebop band, and playing with big bands and playing on albums and living the dream, running yeah. from studio yeah. to studio and doing stupid numbers of sessions until all hours of the morning. And then um, and then eventually I had something I had to give and uh, I thought I'll, 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 I was playing on ads and, and, and movie scores and stuff as well so I thought oh, maybe I'll stop, something's got to stop so I'll, I'll stop the live gigs because the ads pay better and the film yeah. scores pay better and so I'll just be a session guy and then uh, and get, I wanted to get into composing more so mm -hmm. I started writing ads and then I started writing cartoon music and got into docos and other things like that. So that's basically it. Wow. Can you can you point to one or two highlights or does it depend on which part yeah, of your career you're Yeah, absolutely. We're well, playing with Melanie, so I would have been 21, at Madison Square Gardens uh -huh. in New York. Oh, sorry, Central Park, not Madison Square, Central Park. Would you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty cool. And uh, what was that, uh, a festival or That was just a Melanie point? concert. Right. Melanie. And so we had uh, a couple of session musicians, Billy Murnett, who was Carly Simon's piano player, and uh, Hugh McCracken, who played on the Ram album with McCartney, and played with all the 
all the heavy sort of fusion, like Steve Gadd. I met Steve Gadd, that was another highlight. I met yeah. Steve Gadd in, in Boston at a club, a little jazz club called Paul Small. He was playing there with a band called Stuff. Richard T on the piano and um, two drummers, Chris Parker from the Breaker Brothers and Steve Gadd, both playing in one wow. band. It was pretty amazing. That was a highlight. Jamie with Chick Corea in, yeah. in 1977, same year, through Emil Pandolfi, the classical guy. He was a friend of uh, Chick Corea's through the Scientology. There was a lot of Scientology musicians around LA at that time, so I got to meet Chick Corea and, and we had a jam at Emil's house, and um, so it was half a dozen. Uh, a couple of chicks band people turned up and his tour manager and his tour manager was a drummer and his personal manager was a trombonist so they nice. came on we, we just played jazz, played a bit of jazz that was fantastic and the what's the Scientology that you mentioned that was well there that was, was a, big a scene? At the time. yeah there was right. a, there was a, a bit of it well it wasn't a scene it's just there was a lot of people were getting into Scientology and eventually getting out of Scientology but it was a thing in the in the mid '70s, where it was the, 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 the Church of Scientology was at that time uh, very focused on um, art and celebrities mm -hmm. and musicians and, and influences kind I of think thing. That's still the case. It's still the case. Yeah. Um, and um, I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life, so. I kind of got into it, and I got into it pretty heavily. Everything I get into, I get into really heavily. Mm -hmm. So like everything else that I've done, including the PhD in music, and my old oldest friends just say, yeah, of course you got into it, of course you did it flat out. <laughs> so I, I did that for a while, and, yeah. uh, and I learned some things. I took out what I liked and rejected the things that were I felt were nonsense and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, um, but I did get to meet Stanley Clark. He was another Scientologist, um, and uh, went to his house and saw his base, and, He's like six foot six, you know, yeah, right. and, and his fingers like this long. And, yeah. But I got to play his bass, which was yeah. pretty amazing that he let me do that and let me work on his house. And so that there were highlights. Um, gig, other gigs. Uh, Sunbury playing at Sunbury with Kush with Jeff mm. Duff, right before Deep Purple. Sunbury, a non-stop festival that draws a crowd of thirty thousand for the Australia Day weekend. Forty bands blare out for nearly twenty hours each day, and Australia's biggest pop festival rocks and rocks and rocks. Mm. Who were my heroes? And Speed King was one of the, Speed King was the song that I probably went. I have to do this music. I have to play. I have to be a bass player and play loud and fast and furious and intense. <laughs> I need. I need to do that. Um, so seeing them play at Sunbury in 1975, there was 25,000 people and we played and then we had a 40 minute break, we were off stage and they were walking around the back in the caravans, there's Richie Blackmore, oh my god. Oh, did you uh, get to have a chat? Not really, they were sort of in a little zone, yeah. getting ready for the gig and we sort of respected that and, mm. uh, and so they did their show and um, there was a fence about 10 feet from or 3 metres from the stage, there was a big high cyclone fence to keep the crowd out but I was able to walk around in that space and I literally put my chin on the stage and there was the bass rig <laughs> 20 feet away it was like just stacked to the ceiling of bass stuff loud as and I just went yeah I'm in heaven yes. <laughs> and of course Ian Pace the drummer was just a fantastic drummer and it was just like thunder and lightning and we go, oh my god, this is so awesome and it's so loud and yeah. you know, when you're 20 years old and male, you're just sort of going, let, let me, hit me, just hit me <laughs> with fantastic. that stuff. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. How about the low lights? Oh, plenty of them. Yeah, so the low lights um, were always me beating myself up over not being worthy. Mm. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, pretty sum, sum them up sum it all up over 46 years of being a bass player this and it wasn't always about my bass playing but but most of the time it was performance anxiety i've never had performance anxiety in terms of playing in front of people right never not, been not a, nerves not as nerves as stage fright. not stage fright no. i've worked with singers that have run off stage or run into the toilet and vomited before every mm -hmm. performance and have other sort of strange things like that but for me i was always ner nervous i was always kind of excited and anxious yeah. and a little bit worried about screwing up mm. but it never kind of affected me affected my playing or anything like that i was always able to concentrate when i got on stage unlike many people i know that are just 
freeze up yeah. in those situations. But my anxiety was more about intensely over ruminating, mm. thinking about, worrying about how I played last night, what the other people would think, and then worrying about tomorrow's gig, what the other, what, and who's going to turn up, and will they like what I played, and, yeah. and um, t obsessive. Right. And I, I'm upset. I, I learned a long time ago. I'm obsessive about absolutely everything, which serves me well. Of course. In certain. It must things. be part of the competitiveness. It is, but it also causes me a lot of heartache and headaches and distress and stuff. And I, I recognise it in others. I know there's plenty of other. Most of the people I work with are high achievers, mm. extraordinary high achievers, including the present company. <laughs> and I'm on the lookout for these signs. Um. um I could talk at length about anxiety and about deep, deep depression, and I, I probably should, but maybe that's another day. You know? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I, I can I can track it back to when I was 17 years old, and living in in a house in Melbourne with no window, and, I, and I, I had a mattress. Every time you tell the mattress on the floor story about Fleetwood Mac, I had a single a single bed mattress. No sheets, single bed mattress, a couple of blankets, and a cardboard box. Cardboard box was great because I could put things in the box or on top of the box, and a base case. And I had a red suitcase covered in road stickers. Yeah. So I had a red suitcase that was falling apart that I just had my stuff in. I had a pair of jeans and a pair of sneakers. They were those um, the iconies with the I plastic. I love iconies. Yeah. But in those days they weren't iconic. Oh, okay. You see, yeah. they were just cheap. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't even know if they were Connie, but they were kind of like that with the plastic white disc on the ankle. Oh, yeah. I don't know if they, but they kind of look a bit like they were canvas. Yeah. They were my shoes. Yeah. That was my shoes. They were it. They were it, and I thought thongs for summer yeah. in Melbourne. Yeah. Thongs and a pair of Connies, or whatever they were. And I had socks and jeans. And the jeans were so worn out that they were ripped like these days, but. But that might not have been fashionable then? Or? It wasn't really, no, 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 you just had ripped jeans. You were just way before your time with the yeah. Oh, yeah, and the jeans. Yeah. And, and lots of t-shirts, Yeah. lots of t-shirts, and that was it, pretty much. And so, like in Cush, they, we had to get dressed up because Colour TV had come in in 1975, yeah. so everyone, if you had to be on Countdown, you had to have colour, so the manager said, you've got to get real colourful clothes, and there weren't any, I, didn't, I couldn't afford any, so I made them. I, I bought curtain material and hand stitched no. things together and made outfits for myself. Those guys were listening to some progressive, they were listening to Yes, Steve Ball was listening to Bud Powell and uh, George Shearing, jazz musicians and stuff. And so they were kind of introducing me, me to some other forms of jazz. And so I thought, yeah, I probably need to get my skills up in terms of theory. I had great ears, always had great ears, because probably because of being a singer and in choir and church and all that other stuff, but it wasn't enough to, to get to the top of the heap. Yeah. I needed to get to the top of the heap, kind of obsessively. It's a secret. Shh, don't tell anyone. No, I'm telling anybody. I'm incredibly competitive. I, my first recording session was with Ernie Rose in Melbourne, who's an incredible engineer, huge CV, enormous. And I, after the session I said, so what's wrong with what I'm doing? Mm. You know, tell me what I need to know. I need to be. I need to be like Barry Sullivan, who was my hero in Australian. Played with Chain and with Renee and people. Okay. Like that. Had a huge reputation. What? What's? What have I got to do? Oh, well, you've got to get a Fender Precision bass for starters, and you. But you need to uh, uh, play with your fingers and with the pick at that stage, because it's in those days. You know, they were still wanting you to use a pick for something, and. Um, and you need to tidy up the start the, between the notes and the fret noise and get rid of that and get rid of your finger noise and you just basically sanitise everything you're playing and then don't make any mistakes. Well, he, did, he didn't say it like that, uh, but that was the takeout that I got yeah. from the conversation. And so I realised that there were, I started noticing then the, the way live bass players tended to play I, I could go and see a live bass player and say, yeah, that's not going to translate in the studio. Right. What he's doing there, that's not going to work. It's too, I can hear him hitting the strings too hard. I can hear him hit, whacking the, the pickups. The bass isn't set up right. It's out of tune at the top. I started to, to put everything that bass players were doing under an extreme microscope because I needed to put myself under the same microscope. 
So the length of notes, you know, the legato, staccato, you know, and all the different marcados and things, what they were, how long each note value was and how they were cutting things off. And I started, it took me, I reckon, 10 years to work out what I wanted to sound like and what role I wanted to fulfill. Because um, there were people around at that time, there were the bass players like Lee Sklar, who was probably the closest to what I ended up being. I think, I think you know, looking back over my career, that, and that's I'm not saying that because I'm saying I'm like Lee, but Lee Sklar had a he he was the foundation of the band, but he had all the chops necessary to do some things that added value to right. the song. Um, Stanley Clark and Pastorius took it to another place in terms of chops and speed and stuff, but I was in a way I was blessed. I never had the fast twitch muscle fibre to play that fast. So I had to kind of temper that quest for ultimate speed and go, well, I'm just going to have to play better lines mm. or more into, not better lines than those guys. But I, if I can just get the lines that are interesting and different and appealing, then people will like what I play. I learned from a guitarist called Steve Murphy that he would leave and suddenly just leave a note out while he's playing. And I asked him about it. He said, yeah, I think I was going to play a mistake. So I just, I just didn't play. That's just, a good I skill. Just, I, and it was just like, and I go, what? That was just he. His fingers, he didn't feel like he was quite there, and so he just left one out and just kept going. He didn't miss a beat. Yeah. And he said, because in those days, if you played a wrong note, you had to re-record it. If you left a note out. They could probably get away with that. Yeah, right. <laughs> so it comes from the days of analog tape recording. Yeah. You know, just, uh... I thought I have to pick something that I love, and hockey's an amateur sport. I, I, I literally it came down to it, either play hockey or music, and right. hockey's amateur. Nobody gets paid money, not even the Olympians in those days in the seventies, nobody gets paid, so I can't live off that. If I play music, I might if I get good I might make like fifty bucks a week, which isn't great money, but I can live off that. That'll do. Yeah. And I'll be happy. Yeah. So I chose that path. It was that simple. Wow. And then thirty years later I got a PhD. I rang my mum when I graduated at Newcastle Uni, uh, when I got awarded the uh, PhD, I rang my mum. I was sixty years old by the time I graduated. I rang my mum who's now ninety one and said, Mum I got my, it's, it's all approved, I'm now Dr. Clive. And she went, oh, that's lovely, dear. And she, you know, <laughs> that's lovely, dear. And I said, so if this music thing doesn't work out, I've got something to fall back on. At age I love it, I love it. She went, oh, ho, ho. She thought that was pretty funny. Because that was obviously the thing that everyone was worried about oh, yeah, in those I days. What have you got yeah. to fall back? Have you got a trade in case it doesn't work out? Yeah. yeah. I think it worked out. Yeah, I think it kind of yeah. worked out, yeah. yeah. True.